Cancer Council New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians, both past and present, of the lands on which we live and work. Hello and welcome, my name is Jill Mills and tonight we will be talking about survivorship care planning. First some housekeeping, so if you experience any technical problems you can either mention them in the chat box, which you'll see to the left on your screen, or call the 1800 number shown in the chat box, it's just popped up there now. If you have any sound problems, you can listen using your telephone by dialing the 1800 number also shown in the chat box and enter the pass, the code that's in there, the passcode provided. So we want to hear from you in the chat box tonight. Um, we encourage you to participate and support each other. Tell us what you think about the information being presented, whether you can relate or not, was the information useful to you, would you actually do any of the things mentioned, etc. Um, and if you've got any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box as well. And we'll get to the ones that we can. We had a lot of questions, um, about 80 or so questions, and we'll talk, come to them later in the presentation. And some of the questions we've already addressed in the presentation as well. So, so The webinar is being recorded. Um, everyone who registered will be sent a link to the recording after in the, ne in the next sort of few days, um, with the weekend coming up, probably Tuesday, Wednesday next week. Um, so you can watch the presentation later. If you get distracted by the chat box, which sometimes happens, um, you can revisit everything. So again, at any stage, if you feel like you need to speak to someone urgently, don't hesitate to call a Lifeline counsellor on 13 11 14, which is available 24 hours a day. So let's get started. First, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, we've got next to me Sabrina Wren, who's going to give you her story about her experience. Um, Claire Wagfield, and you probably, I guess you've all read the bios of our presenters, and Jeanette Vardy, who's sitting at home, dialed in to talk to us. So, welcome everybody. Um, so, Annie Miller's in the chat box monitoring the chat, so say hello to Annie. Um, she'll be answering your questions and helping with any queries you might have. So, I'm going to pass over to Sabrina. Thanks, Sabrina. And I'm going to be clicking through the slides, so... Okay. And do we want to leave the aircon on? Yeah. So. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Sabrina. Uh, I'm a mother of five children. I'm a trained counsellor and psychotherapist, not working at the moment. Um, at the moment I'm a student of art therapy and uh, I'm enjoying attending art therapy, uh, an art therapy support group for myself as well as um, leading an art therapy group at the cottage at um, the survivorship clinic at Concord. So my uh, story begins uh, in 1972 when I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease. Um, I was young and naive and uh, I really didn't know that Hodgkin's disease was cancer. That was followed by a splenectomy and uh, and radiation, um, five weeks of radiation, four days a week. And that was followed by 11 years of um, annual checks with the doctor. And uh, really, I just got on with life. I was pronounced cured and I got on with my life. I got married and um, had a large family. Uh, in 2007, I discovered a very small lump in my right breast. Uh, it was um, only seven millimetres. Um, I was very frightened. But the doctor assured me that um, I could have surgery and uh, everything would be okay. And a lump I was expecting. But... Due to my past history of Hodgkin's disease and radiation, which I thought was in the uh, in the past, uh, I then had to have a, a mastectomy. So the radiation was beginning to play a part in my life again. Uh, somebody told me along the way that I'd had my life's dose of radiation and. I began questioning, uh, uh, just 
questioning what the radiation was actually doing. Um, and I, I thought that if uh, radiation had caused my breast cancer, which I wasn't 100% sure, uh, then surely I would get breast cancer again in my other breast. And uh, sure enough, in 2013, I found another lump and it was the same story, really. Uh, mastectomy again and no further treatment both times. I had to then get used to being a woman with no breasts. Somehow it was all right uh, being a woman with one breast, but no breast was harder for me to get my head around. And I began questioning what else the radiation could do. And I wasn't really able to find many answers. I researched online and uh, it was all pretty scary, really. But I put all that uh, aside and got on with life and uh, continued with a part-time job and uh, took on study. But what I found is I couldn't think and I couldn't make head or tail of the study notes that I had. And I found that I was crying all the time. Um, I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. And I was uh, a bit of a mess. And I looked a bit like this. <laughs> <laughs> that was good timing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so it was at this stage somebody asked me, um, what is it that you really want to do, Sabrina? Uh, because this obviously wasn't working and uh, and what I really wanted to do was get on the road and just go and take off I suppose to get away from it all I didn't think it was possible at first but I sorted it out and uh, and it did actually happen and, and so here you are on the road so here I am <laughs> this is how I lived on and off for about a year and were you by yourself? I was by myself, yeah. And it was the best thing for me, uh, allowing time to do what I wanted to do. And and what happened is I processed everything that had happened. Um, I had to think about my mortality, um, how long was my life going to be, and it got me thinking about if my life was going to be short, how did I want to live it? So without that pressure um, and finding a new way of looking at life, I was able to relax and enjoy myself. And in the end, this is how I felt. Um, <laughs> it's such a, a joyful picture. A joy, a joy of life, yes. So I felt alive and positive and uh, I was coming home with some new ideas and a big part of that uh, was uh, a need to be creative and to have art around me which led me to studying art therapy. Uh, mosaics is uh, one of my pastimes that I've been dabbling in and as I was putting these slides together, I, I realised what a metaphor this was, um, taking the tiles, piecing them together and making something new and beautiful and this is really what I've been doing mm. with my life, piecing everything together and, uh, and creating something new and looking at life in a, a different way. But there was still one piece that... Um, an important piece that I needed and this was the medical support that could probably answer my questions, could look at me as an individual and um, and keep and monitor me really holistically. Um, my research t 
told me that there was there were clinics overseas and in Melbourne, but I had a lot of trouble finding something in Sydney at first. Um, yeah. Mm. Next. Next slide. Yeah. <laughs> and and then somehow I found the survivorship clinic at Concord, and um, I wondered if I would meet the criteria of going there because. My original cancer was a long time ago. My second one was in New Zealand, but um, it was okay. I made an appointment. And on that first appointment, uh, it was, I was booked for two to three hours, and I saw a number of health professionals. Um, they would take turns. They would spend 15 or 20 minutes with me taking notes. There was uh, the oncologist, the psychologist, the dietitian, the exercise physiologist, physiologist and the breast care nurses. And uh, this was really the beginning of my care plan. Um, following that I also enrolled into the Enrich program that was uh, a six week program. Uh, run by the dietitian and the exercise physiologist once a week for six weeks and uh, and this really made a difference uh, to my health uh, and at the same time I was meeting other people in the group and uh, and I was also introduced to the, the survivorship cottage where there are a number of workshops held um, mindfulness, yoga, dance art therapy. So here's part of a photo here of, of um, some of the people that, some of the participants that come along to the art therapy. This is the art therapy that you, you're teaching? Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I'm teaching. Well, but I'm running. <laughs> facilitating. <laughs> facilitating, yeah. that's right, yes. And, and that's, uh, that's an amazing, um, that brings joy for me because two years ago I didn't have art in my life. So my life has really turned around. Um, so the support of the um, survivorship clinic and you know and the care plan provides a security for me and it alleviates uh, a lot of the stress that comes with the many unknowns that cancer brings and contributes to me uh, in a big way and moving forward and feeling positive. Thank you Sabrina. Thank you. Lovely story. And we'll talk more because we'll be, you know, talking about the Concord Cancer Centre yeah. with, with Jeanette's presentation. So, okay. Yeah. So thank you. So we'll hand over to Jeanette now. So she's going to pop up, and we're going to disappear for a few minutes while Jeanette presents. Welcome, Jeanette. Thank you. So I thought I'd speak firstly about um, what actually is a cancer survivor. So. The National Cancer Institute in the US has an Office of Cancer Survivorship and they came up with the definition that it's the experience of living with, through and beyond a diagnosis of cancer. There's a lot of different, different definitions about what constitutes a survivor. We tend to use the broadest definition which is a person becomes a survivor from the day they're diagnosed with a cancer until the day that they die. That may be unfortunately a short time for a few people, but for many, they may live for decades um, and their cancer is cured, but they still would be a survivor. Um, other places say that you become a survivor after you've completed your primary treatment. So that would be your surgery, chemotherapy and or radiotherapy. Um, but you could be a survivor and for example, be on hormonal treatment for breast cancer. There's also some that have a stricter criteria that you've got to be disease free from the cancer for a certain number of years. And for uh, children, it's often alive and five years after the diagnosis of cancer. And the haematologists also tend to more inclined to use that later, latter um, definition. So, Traditionally and importantly, the focus was on acute treatment. And then once people were through the cancer and um, 
potentially may have been cured of their cancer, the focus then became follow-up for that, looking for um, making sure that there was no recurrence of the cancer. And we actually uh, didn't understand very well the whole experience of surviving cancer. So thankfully there's been a shift where obviously the quantity of the survival time is extremely important, but we've also got to remember that we also need quality of that time. And there's also been a move more recently that um, survivors should be engaged and um, playing an important role in managing their own well-being. So us as clinicians, um, certainly patients or survivors, family, friends, employees have this assumption that once you have finished your um, primary cancer treatment that everything will go back to normal. And many cancer survivors find that in fact things are quite different to their life before cancer. So they may need to find a new normal. And some people describe that period as actually being more difficult than when they were going through the active treatment such as chemotherapy. So in 2006, there was this landmark report came from the US Institute of Medicine called Lost in Translation. And they um, said that this post-treatment phase should be quite a distinct phase in the cancer survivor journey. And that we as oncologists and health providers often didn't do this very well. So that there were a lot of unmet needs from survivors, also from their caregivers and families. And that we underestimated the distress for patients and that the care was fairly poorly coordinated. And one of the recommendations they made to try and improve this was that all survivors should receive a survivorship care plan when they finished their initial treatment. So what are sort of the medical issues that some people um, face? Well, we know from research that even for those that are lucky where the cancer has been totally treated and there's no evidence of a recurrence, that the general health of those people is not quite as good as that of their um, other people who are the same age but who have not had cancer. And what are some of the reasons for this? Well, we have to acknowledge that there always is an increased risk of cancer. It may be of a recurrence of the same cancer or it may be a development of a second primary cancer that may be the same type, so for example, uh, a breast cancer in the other breast, or unfortunately for a small percent of people, it may actually be another cancer that's secondary to the actual cancer treatment. So for example, rarely people can get acute leukemia from the chemotherapy we give them to treat the initial cancer. And if you've had one cancer, it may be that you have either some genetic or other environmental thing that makes you more susceptible to further cancers. Cancer survivors themselves report a lot of issues and there's a number of different areas. So if we look at physical, for example, fatigue is a really important problem. And this can occur for years after someone has had treatment, even if they uh, have no evidence of a recurrence of their disease. Now the types of issues people have will of course depend on what type of treatment they received and the strength of that treatment, how long they received it for, etc. So other problems can be things like some people have fertility issues after having had chemotherapy and again even people who have no evidence of a cancer coming back may be left with residual pain. I do a lot of research on cognitive function and we know that there's a subgroup of people where their memory and concentration is not as good after having had cancer and or cancer treatment. 
But one of the biggest issues that most people complain about, or, or are concerned about, I should say, is this underlying fear about will the cancer come back? And that can affect every aspect of their life. And this can present as uncertainty with regard to their future. So for example, I had a um, survivor say to me, I went in to renew my license or my passport, I can't remember which it was, and I wasn't sure how long I want, whether to pay the extra and get a longer period of time, or just go for the short period. Well, here in Australia, we Sorry, everyone, we've just lost Jeanette's sound, so we're just trying to fix that up at the moment. So just bear with us for a moment. Um, and we're just reading Angela's comment, which um, talking about, you know, as um, a teenager, and I guess you can all see the comment up there, um, and talking about childhood cancer survivors in the 70s and 80s. So I don't know whether or not, you know, what's happening now is obviously different. It was you had radiation in that era as well. So whether or not Claire, you want to make some comment about radiation compared to from then till now, yeah. what the difference is? I think definitely that um, physicians have learned from the experiences of those who were treated in the eighties, like Sabrina, um, and definitely use radiation as little as possible now, and know to screen much more earlier for young women. Uh, make sure that they catch any that do come through. And that's why research in, um, in long-term survivors is really important because it helps you to change the treatment um, that is given to new children and uh, adults with cancer. Yeah, and so the radiotherapy is a lot more targeted there as well. Yes. So yeah, so I think it's more targeted and as as little as possible uh, in terms of dose, so that you don't end up with your lifetime of radiation like you got um, mm -hmm. too early in life. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a really a positive thing about staying engaged, I guess, with mm -hmm. um, your survivorship team, whoever that is, uh, and reporting back the things that happen to you, so that we can learn for future generations. Mm -hmm. And so, what else is she saying there about? I guess she's feeling like she's a forgotten group. Can we move on to um, Claire's presentation? Would that be a good idea? Yeah. And we can come back. Is she back in the room? There we go. That, that's it. Um, yep. So I was talking about the potential fear of recurrence and then um, I'm not sure quite when it cut out, but even though we have a fantastic medical system here in Australia, there are definitely financial problems for people with um, medical costs, out-of-pocket costs, and difficulty sometimes recommencing their employment. There can be social issues, so things dynamics may have changed within the family while the one person's being sick with other family members maybe having to take over their roles, so there's a whole thing of re-establishing that. And then there's the whole thing of re-evaluating values and goals. And not to cast doom and gloom on this, because for some people, they can have really good experience from some aspects of having got through cancer treatment or um, is that they've actually re-evaluated their values and goals. And sometimes they've come up with a more balanced system or worked out for them what the really important things are. Um, so we were wanting to be able to learn how to better manage uh, or help survivors manage their disease and any lasting treatment effects. And so in September 2013, we opened the Sydney Survivorship Centre, which is at Concord Cancer Centre. And our aim is to provide a more holistic care for adult survivors. Um, and so we're going to move on to Claire's slides. Sorry, we're having a few technical issues um, with Jeanette's presentation. So we're going to fix those, hopefully, and come back to, to Jeanette. So um, Claire, thank you, and we're going to sure. begin with your presentation. <laughs> thank you, and thank you again, Sabrina. I think you perfectly um, introduced us and introduced the topic, and it's always the most valuable part of these sorts of things is hearing a real story. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what a survivorship care plan is uh, and 
Um, I hope that that's helpful. Um, and where I, where possible, I've tried to incorporate this, the um, questions that you put in before uh, tonight. Uh, I've tried to sneak them into my presentation. So if you see a question pop up, it might be from one of you um, looking, to, and hopefully I've answered it adequately. And there'll also be time at the end for questions as well. Yeah. Um, so I was going to tell you a little bit about who I am because I'm a little bit different to Jeanette in that I'm not an oncologist. Um, I still have a few things to say about survivorship care plans, so that's good. Uh, and then tell you a little bit about what they are, what types there are out there, uh, and tell you a little bit about some of our research about what survivors actually want uh, in terms of their survivorship care planning, and then hopefully plenty of time for discussion at the end. Um, so first of all to say I work in paediatric cancer. Uh, I used to do a lot of work in adult cancer as well, but certainly the last eight years I've mainly worked with uh, children uh, and in childhood cancer survivorship uh, at the Behavioural Sciences Unit at, Sydney, uh, at um, Sydney Children's Hospital. And we do all sorts of research. Um, so I'm a researcher rather than a, a clinician uh, with a psychology background. But primarily I wanted to tell you today that we do a lot of research in survivorship. So I hope that that information that we've learned from a research perspective is really valuable as well um, for um, families and survivors going through this experience. Um, so this is a wonderful success story in paediatrics. Uh, this is a survival curve over the last sort of 50 years in terms of, um, you know, more than 50 years ago, childhood cancer survivor, uh, childhood cancer was almost universally fatal. And now more than 85% of um, children with cancer survive. And there's really similar figures and similar data out there for adult cancer survivors as well, which is fantastic. Um, I guess one of the things that has happened with that is we've created what I would call a survival epidemic. So we have thousands and thousands of young people and older people who all have survived cancer and a very large proportion of them will have some kind of late effect which was like a late side effect of the treatment that they had or the cancer that they had. And they can be on a spectrum from things that are kind of mildly life altering. Uh, and Je Jeanette was just starting to talk about those sorts of things. So, you know, mild concerns about the future or mild impairment in mobility, for example, through to really li quite life threatening things. So, what Jeanette mentioned before about, um, you know, cancers coming back or new cancers coming, or um, particularly in uh, young people who've had uh, childhood cancer, uh, things to do with say heart disease or obesity and those sorts of things. So I guess what is important to remember is that, uh, that survivorship care is really quite a tricky thing. So it goes for a long time, so as Jeanette mentioned, um, it's really from the time you finish treatment or maybe five years after treatment um, through to the rest of your life. Um, and so in children anyway, that they live an average of 60 to 70 years afterwards. So this is a long-term plan we're talking about here. And it's also a tricky thing to manage because there's many conditions and many organs that are affected. Um, and that's what Jeanette, I think, was going to tell us about in a bit more detail was that um, that can be you know, any organ system over any time period in life. And people change, you know, they age, they age and as each age comes, um, different th conditions and things can happen. Uh, and so as you go through a new transition, then different things become important. And one of the important things, um, particularly in childhood cancer, survivorship is that people's risk of developing late effects is actually increasing over time rather than decreasing. So it becomes more important for them to get follow-up as they get older rather than, which is the time that you yeah. think possibly is the time, oh, it's been 15 years now, I don't need to worry about it anymore. That's actually when you need to start thinking more. Um, so the other thing that's so tricky about survivorship care is it involves multiple specialists. So um, you've had, all of you would have had um, care from, you know, potentially an oncologist or a haematologist. Uh, you might have care from your GP, from a surgeon, a radiation oncologist, a nurse, a psychologist. All of those people are quite hard to coordinate and sometimes in survivorship it's, people don't know who the right person is to coordinate that care so that makes it difficult as well. Um, the other thing is that GPs often have not a lot of knowledge about um, survivorship and what things they should be looking out for. So GPs might be the natural person to go to because they're your local sort of physician, but they also may not feel particularly confident in uh, knowing what sort of tests to order, how often for particular people with particular diseases. Um, so I guess survivorship care plans have been suggested as a potential solution to all these um, the tricky aspects of survivorship care. 
So survivorship care plan, I guess, is a tool um, to help survivors and, um, and health professionals to summarise the critical information that's relevant to that survivor. Uh, and the idea is that it's meant to help to improve communication between the survivor and all of their healthcare professionals. Uh, it, might prevent, uh, recommend, they, it might recommend future screening. I've lost a word on my slide there, but that's meant to say future screening and future tests. Uh, for surveillance and it might recommend really important health behaviours that might be particularly important say for a survivor that they stay a healthy weight or they avoid eating um, unhealthy foods for example and it might provide referrals say so it might have a suggestion for who the right cardiologist for this person is or who the right psychologist is for this person. Um, the, I thought it might be the easiest way to show you, to sort of describe what one is, is to show you a few. And you can see if I show you a few of them, um, that there's some quite common themes between them. Usually they're divided into sort of a treatment summary at the top, and these are um, paper versions. I'll show you some online versions as well. Usually the top half of the um, of a survivorship care plan says what the um, what the patient had or what the survivor had in terms of their disease, and then also the treatments that they've had, um, usually sort of cumulative dose or something, so we know exactly how much radiation that person's had over their lifetime. And then the second half of the plan is usually the more planning bit. It's the recommendations for this person should have breast screening every two years from this age, for example. Um, they really are quite similar. So this is Jeanette's uh, survivorship care plan, uh, which is based on a an American one. Um, if you wanted to see some others, one of the things we've been doing recently is collecting them across the country to see if we can make one that actually might be relevant for the entire country rather than each hospital producing their own. Yeah. Um, so this is the one from the Children's Hospital at Westmead. Uh, here's one from the Children's Hospital in Sydney at Randwick. Uh, and here's a New Zealand one. So we'd like to do something with New Zealand as well if we can. And even the overseas ones are quite similar as well. So this is the one from the European Union. So this is one of your questions um, that were sent in before tonight was, what are the best ways to improve your survivorship experience? And I guess why this webinar has um, been put together today is that possibly survivorship care plans are one of the ways you could improve your survivorship mm. experience is if you uh, have one to help guide the way that you're cared for. So I guess the question then becomes, do they work? What, do, are, they, are they things that are quite useful? Um, there's not a lot of data out there exactly showing um, you know, their impact. Uh, and so this is a review that Jeanette actually um, identified that was done in Melbourne, um, where they actually reviewed 69 articles, all in adult cancer. Um, and I've, I think the childhood literature is very similar. Um, to, to have a look at essentially at what, what's the impact or do, do survivorship care plans improve your experience of survivorship. Um, most of the research to say up front, which is unfortunately the case for a lot of research, is focused on breast cancer survivors. Mm. Um, and generally there's sort of positive outcomes reported for survivors if they use a survivorship care plan, but it's mostly focused on patient satisfaction. So do you like having a, a plan like this? Do you find it something that's useful for you? And the majority of patients and survivors will say yes. Um, there's not a lot of data there to say that they will change outcomes, that they're going to make sure people... So there's a little bit to say that um, potentially people might be more likely to stick to the screening plan that they're meant to have if they have a plan, um, but that literature still has to come. Um, health professionals, when, they, when you ask them about um, survivorship care plans, they quite like them, particularly GPs um, value them because it gives them a step-by-step -step guide as to what you should do with this patient. Um, but, however, there are a few problems with survivorship care plans as well, and I think that's worth uh, noting. So implementation is quite inconsistent. So some centres give you, give you one when you finish treatment and others don't. And as I mentioned before, different people record different things in survivorship care plans. So you might, in one centre, they might say the, you know, the cumulative dose of radiation that a patient has had, and in another centre, it's just a yes, no, this is what, you know, whether or not they had them. So it would be great if there was one that was consistent across everyone where you had, you know, an agreed minimum set of information that would be useful. Um, there is definitely a lack of consensus about the content and the format of how, how they should be delivered and there's really little work at the moment saying that how they sort of work in the very long term, so we're talking 10 or 15 years later. 
One of your other questions was who can arrange a survivorship care plan for you? That's actually quite a tricky question to answer and I think Sabrina mentioned that it was hard to find the right person for her. Um, I, my sort of answer to that was usually it's an oncologist who might lead the process of arranging one for you and putting the information together that you need. If they're lucky enough to have a nurse to support them in their survivorship work, then the nurse might do that. Sometimes a survivor clinic will do that if you're um, lucky enough to be eligible for one. And sometimes the survivor needs to do it themselves. Um, that still happens, and I think Janine, uh, Jeanette mentioned that as well, that sometimes it's the survivor who needs to be their own advocate and take, and take responsibility for trying to sort this out for themselves. There's sort of a similar question, but who should lead a survivorship care plan, which is another one of your questions. So I took this to mean who kind of, who implements the, the recommendations of the survivorship care plan, I guess. Um, so for this question, I guess I thought maybe usually your GP is the right person to implement a lot of the things that are recommended in there. Potentially a survivor clinic, if you're able to go to one, that would be fantastic. And maybe if we if we sort out the um, technical issues, maybe Jeanette will have some time to come back on at the end to tell us a bit more about her clinic. Um, sometimes the oncologist or a nurse might be able to lead that for you. And again, like I mentioned, sometimes it's the survivor who needs to say, okay, I know I need to have screening at this time. I'm going to make sure that I do that. Um, but it's worth bearing in mind they're not used a lot. They're not only inconsistent, but often not used a lot. So this was a report from a couple of years ago that showed that less than 20% of oncologists said they consistently report, provided a survivorship care plan um, for every patient that they had. So why? Why don't we use them if they sort of, if patients quite like them and health professionals find them useful? I guess the question is they quite take a lot of time to complete. Um, so they take not only sort of time but resources. There's a nurse or a, um, a, or a um, oncologist needs to actually find the information and put it in the form and think about exactly what the appropriate care plan is for that person. They're really hard to keep up to date because as people age their needs change and new research comes up that says you should have this test instead mm -hmm. of that test or you should, uh, for these particular groups of people we should change the regime to this kind of regime. So, And there's always this a whole lot of new, really sick patients that are coming to the hospital. So people who've been newly diagnosed rightly should have most of the attention of the physicians there. So it's very hard for hospitals to allocate, you know, this allocate a lot of resources to keeping on up to date uh, information for every survivor, and they never drop off the other end. Hopefully, so you have this, you know, ever growing population of patients mm -hmm. that you're trying to look out for. So I guess one of the new innovations I wanted to mention to you is uh, about the possibility of having survivorship care plans online instead of on a paper. So in the paper ones, I guess the idea is you take it with you. With your, when you go to your GP, you take the piece of paper with you and you show them and say, this is what I need to do. Um, online survivorship care plans are relatively new. Um, there's a few studies that have, said, have investigated whether they're a good idea. About three quarters in this particular study, about three quarters of survivors said that, that improved, they improved their knowledge about their late effects or their risks after they were given one and given access to one. Uh, and almost all of them in this particular study said they felt more aware of the benefits of follow-up for them, so why it was worthwhile them continuing to see their um, physicians. Um, there's a general feeling that they do really help to facilitate communication between the clinic and the GP and the survivor mm. um, because the clinic can put something in there and then the GP can look at it uh, and you have the sort of three-way communication which is really tricky when it's done by letters. Um, and the majority of GPs in this particular study who um, you know, had, had a patient come back to them with an online care plan said that they felt more capable of looking after that survivor when they had one access to this tool. So there's a few advantages to going online. Um, so one of them is that they're more accessible. So you can log in from anywhere to, um, to be able to get access to the information. So if you forget that, if you lose that piece of paper in amongst all your hundreds of files you probably ac accumulated about your medical treatment, you can still access it. It doesn't matter if the doctor, if your doctor's changed because you've always got it with you. Um, it's hard to lose <laughs> and it's easy to update. So anyone, ideally anyone in your care team can update that uh, and it doesn't have to be reprinted and sent out again. 
Um, and the newest in innovation, I guess, is having ones that are available on your mobile phone. Uh, and I think that they're really, you know, a positive development, um, particularly because for certain groups of people, that's how they access the internet these days. Not, not everyone, particularly say young people, uh, don't don't have access to a, you know a traditional computer, but they do True. have their phone with them all the time. Um, here's some examples so you get a sense because it's hard to imagine what they might look like. So I just um, found a couple for you to have a look at. So this is um, one. This is a website called Survivor Link, and you can see here what it looks like. And you can actually there's all sorts of different features on there, but you can type in your own details about what you've had, and then it pops up with all sorts of resources and fact sheets um, for you to help manage your survivorship care. Here's a nice online. Uh, here's a nice one that's a website and an online tool. And so in this one, you can type in all of your details of what treatment you've had, uh, all the drugs that you've received, the radiation that you've received, uh, and it, it has a sort of diary component so you can schedule in your appointments. And there's a chat component so you can chat to other uh, survivors, which is fantastic as well. Um, this is one for adolescents and young adults called Healthy Survivorship. So I think this is primarily a mobile phone version and really quite a nice one. It's got all these different tools on here. It's a little hard for me to see. Um, the screen's a bit far away, but um, if you zoom in, I think you can see the different features there to help you manage your survivorship care better, I guess. So I guess I want to finish with this last question that was asked by someone, which was, what would survivorship care look like if it was designed by survivors? Maybe I'm not the right person. Maybe Sabrina <laughs> should have answered this question. <laughs> maybe you can. After it. See if you agree with what I'm about to say, maybe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what you say. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess it was the perfect opportunity to tell you about one of our big studies that we've been running um, across the country, actually, uh, supported by ANSTRO, which is the Children's Hematology Oncology Group. Um, this is a study where really we wanted um, cancer survivors to tell us what they want in terms of their model of care. So essentially, hopefully answering that person's question about what, do, what would it look like if we actually asked people what they wanted. Um, and the idea, I guess, of designing a new model of care is to make sure that we meet the needs of survivors, um, but also meet the needs of the health service who can't provide you know, monthly appointments for every person who's ever had cancer for the rest of their lives and also involve GPs as much as we can as that sort of core person who might be able to coordinate care for a lot of people. Um, we sent questionnaires out to su survivors and parents and then we also interviewed survivors, parents, um, oncologists, GPs, nurses, anyone who would consent to be interviewed about what they thought about were the best way to provide care for survivors. So the first thing to say is to look at this is to see how many people have received a survivorship care plan in our study. We have more than 500 participants in the study. Um, how many used or referred to them and how many would have liked an online one. So the yellow, the yellow columns are people who come to our survivorship clinic. You can see there we're doing quite a good job um, of sending them out. So about 80% of people said that they received a care plan, which is a lot um, more than the people who don't come to a long-term follow-up clinic. However, there's not a huge... We were a little disappointed, I guess, about how many people use them. So only less than 50% of people um, who come to clinic say they ever use them uh, or refer to them, uh, and even less of the people who don't come to clinic, so those non-attendees in the blue column. Um, but really quite a strong preference there for if it was online, I might be able to use it a bit more. It would be more practical for me. So mm -hmm. the barriers seem to be things like, well, I lost it and you know, I handed up at the GP at a time I wasn't expecting, so I didn't have it in my handbag, those sorts of problems, which potentially this online care plan could um, uh, counteract. And we also can see here these are the health professionals that we interviewed as well. I think we had about 800, um, 800 that would be a big study, 81 <laughs> key, survivors, key stakeholders who we talked to about this as well. Um, and um, out of those, all of the parents and survivors who we interviewed and a lot, large proportion of the health professionals also endorsed the idea of using an electronic um, survivorship care plan. So in terms of benefits, this is what survivors told us um, that they saw as the benefits of using an online care plan. Um, so about three quarters of them said that it would improve their um, confidence in being able to care for themselves, which is a great thing because you want people to feel 
that sense of self-efficacy, I guess, that they um, really value, uh, that they feel confident in knowing what they need and how to get it. Um, and also that they felt that their GPs would be better able to care for them if they had this tool to be able to um, describe, uh, you know, to have, I guess, a prescription for how to care for that patient. Um, they also felt that it might reduce repetition because you don't have to, every time they come to a clinic appointment with a different physician, they don't have to say, oh, this is my whole story. They can say, here, have a look at this. This is what I had. This is what I've done. Um, and that that actually might reduce the length of the consultation. Um, so, And that's a nice quote there from um, a male survivor who said, you know, it might prompt the GP and they'd be more aware, which is something that people can worry about with their GPs. Um, so I guess I've, I was going to finish up, I guess, talking about what are the essential features of a tool like this. So uh, most people said that it had to, well, I think it should be really 100% safe, should have accurate information that's up to date. Um, a lot of people liked the idea of having access to personal records as well so that it was sort of linked directly with their medical record, which would be fantastic, quite a tricky thing to achieve. Um, not a huge amount said it had to be completely personalised. So um, some of the tools that are out there, you put in your details yourself and it comes up with sort of as like an automatic calculator. Um, that seemed acceptable to quite a lot of people. But there are also things that worry survivors about this sort of thing, so um, particularly about security and privacy. So if someone picks up your mobile phone, can they access the information on there? Um, so I think that's really important to think about as well. Um, so this is a study, if we're still open, so if you wanted to go to that website if you were interested in any more detail or you wanted to participate, um, it's just isurvived.org.au. But it is at the moment only for childhood cancer survivors, uh, although there's, I, I know that Jeanette also, I saw on her slides, which haven't been shown, she has similar sorts of work um, mm. for our research for um, adult cancer survivors, so you could look that up too, or you, I'm sure you could download the presentation afterwards. Um, yeah, we send it out to well. everyone. Yeah, perfect, perfect. So and hopefully, Jeanette, well. can't, she's back oh, online. Fantastic, so. fantastic. Um, so and that's the question. So we might... Yeah. Do you want me to move up to Jeanette's slides? Or? Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. So we're going to get Jeanette back on. And um, I don't know if you remember where... Hi, Jeanette. <laughs> Hi. Okay. So what we do at the Survivorship Clinic... The clinic is the one part where our definition of a survivor has to be someone who has completed their primary treatment and have no evidence of recurrence of their disease. For all our other activities, that can be anybody who's had a diagnosis of cancer at any time um, in their disease journey. Um, and so we book people to come in for an entire afternoon. And um, as Sabrina said, they, they see five different people. So during that time, they see either an oncologist or hematologist, uh, dietitian, exercise physiologist, cancer nurse, and psychologist. So it's the whole aim is that it's a multidisciplinary model, and this is quite unique in Australia for adult cancer survivors. Um, and if need be, we can refer people to other um, appropriate people. Prior to them coming. Uh, to the clinic, people are sent out a, a package and that includes a number of questionnaires. So we're interested in things like their quality of life, levels of distress, uh, symptoms, um, levels of physical activity and sedentary behaviour um, and food diaries. And we find that if people have done this um, homework prior to coming, they get a lot more out of the clinic. Um, each person then receives a survivorship care plan which uh, we go through uh, with the survivor at the clinic and this has a lot of the things that Claire has already spoken about so I'll keep moving from there. And there's a medical assessment but also um, big focus on psychosocial side effects and late effects. And again, we're interested in trying to um, facilitate people into adopting a healthy lifestyle, um, things that will help to decrease the risk of their cancer coming back but also improving their general health. Um, and they get a package of information with the DVD and then referrals um, as they need to. And for probably two-thirds of survivors, we only see them the once at that clinic. 
but um, depending on their oncologist's preference and their preference, for about a third, we then become their primary follow-up. So we do all the follow-up. And in that case, each time they come, they're seen by a doctor and a nurse specialist in their area. So again, the big thing is obviously looking to make sure that there's no sign of a cancer recurrence, but particularly late effects, um, and trying to coordinate care between specialists and GPs. Um, but the big focus is on healthy lifestyle. Um, we also um, have a lot of integration between our clinical side of things and our research. Sorry, just trying to advance the slides. Can we go to, I'll try a different way. We run a number of courses, again, that, and these are all free for cancer survivors at any stage of their cancer journey. Again, big emphasis on physical activity. Um, we do medical qigong, mindfulness, yoga. We have art therapy, music therapy, things like scrapbooking, card making, um, and uh, support groups, as well as workshops. Oops, it's not advancing. We'll try a different way. We've been fortunate to set up a little survivorship gym, um, which is particularly for our cancer survivors. Um, and so we have an exercise physiologist, um, Jane, and also our um, some exercise physiology students who help us out there. And a really important part, as Claire has said, is that we need research to to go on to tell us how best we can cope with um, survivorship issues. And so our um, group from Sydney University, which Dr. Hariana Dillon and myself co-lead, the types of things we're particularly interested in is cognitive function, physical activity, and symptom control. So that was the main things that um, I would like to discuss. Thanks, Jeanette. I'm going to put us back on here. So we're back again. So we'll thank you very much, Jeanette. Sorry about all those disruptions there. So we got through no eventually. Um, I think we didn't... Hopefully, we, did we miss any of your slides or did we get them all? No, that's fine. All good? Okay. So we're going to move down. There were a few um, extra questions that we've got in here. We did. We always tend to get a lot of medical questions, and the thing with specific medical questions, you really need to um, talk to your, you know, treating specialist or GP or oncologist, whoever it is that you're seeing, um, because we really can't answer those specific medical questions here. Um, we did get a lot of questions, and naturally, it goes with the subject of survivorship care planning about worrying about your cancer coming back. So that all goes hand in hand, I think, with the survivorship care planning. And I'm sure Jeanette would understand when you see people at Concord Hospital that that's one, something that comes up a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and also talking about late effects. And again, this is the childhood cancers and the late effects, um, the effects of chemotherapy. So we had a lot of questions around those, those um, topics. We have actually done webinars on all those topics. So if you go to our website and we'll be providing everyone that registered with the information of how to get to our website and you can watch those webinars at any time talking about the fear of recurrence, late effects and the effects of chemotherapy and lots of other subjects. This is actually our 15th webinar so there's a lot of different things to choose from. So if we go to the questions and as I said earlier we had around about 70 questions. We had about 340 people register for the webinar and we, we are running out of time but as I said we can go a little bit over. So I think, just picked out a few questions here and I I like this first one, how do you stay motivated to stay with your plan? And it's kind of like, as Jeanette was talking about, encouraging people to live a healthy lifestyle. Um, and it's like when you start a diet and for the first few weeks, you know, you're really good with it and then you sort of lose the momentum. So I'm not sure who wants to answer this question about, you know, maintaining that motivation to stay on your, on a survivorship care plan. Maybe Jeanette? Yeah? Um, what do you think, Jeanette? Have you got any ideas? If you're looking at the evidence uh, for a healthy lifestyle, I think that's the best thing for keeping motivated because people with some of the more common cancers, 
the evidence is showing that if you can maintain a healthy weight range and you can exercise, and this is post-diagnosis, not what you did prior to your cancer diagnosis, that probably you can decrease the risk of that cancer coming back. So not only can you help your cancer and feel better, but you'll also help decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease, of osteoporosis, of um, diabetes, all those other types of things. So I think that in itself is a pretty good motivation. But the other thing I would say is get someone to go along with you. So get your your partner or a friend or anybody to um, to join you perhaps in trying to um, put into play that healthy lifestyle. Yeah, that, that sounds like a, a very good idea, I think. Um, so next question, and I'll just read it out. So how to balance, establish and wade through different views on the social, physical, nutritional, emotional and mental fitness with with ongoing fatigue. And I guess, and as I said, you know, one of the webinars we did was about um, the effects of chemotherapy and a lot of people talk about fatigue after they've had their chemotherapy and I guess the fatigue of finishing your treatment. Um, Sabrina, I'm sure you it's could relate to that. It's overwhelming. Yeah. So this might be a good question for you to sort of think about <laughs> that balancing and all the different views. I mean, it, it becomes, conf and especially these days with the internet, it's, you, there's so much information out there, you can get overwhelmed. Did you, because you looked on the internet for information, did you, how, well, did, how did you I, feel? What I wanted was um, some um, something, some place, somebody to pull all the threads together. Yeah. Uh, because I I just couldn't um, sort all those bits of paper with all the different people involved. Yeah. So it's having that which Concord's helped you with. Yes. And I yes. notice in the chat boxes people asking how do you get to a survivorship clinic and. You know, how how do you take part in such a clinic, which, Jeanette, you might be overwhelmed with people contacting you, but, I mean, obviously not everyone lives in your area or could get there, and, no. you know, we know there are a lot of hospitals that would love to have a survivorship clinic. Um, Jeanette, I think, has been the driving force at Concord to make it happen, and you need you just need to replicate lots of Jeanettes in all the different hospitals around Australia to raise the money to get everyone enthused and do it, and that's... I guess maybe we need to work together to make this happen. So, um, yeah, I'd there are also I think a few links on the next pay on the next slide. There yeah. are links to um, other clinics that are around that we were aware of. So one uh, more in the eastern suburbs of Sydney and in Melbourne. Um, so there are a few other options. Yeah, as well, which is great. Yeah. So there's things happening, but I guess. Go on, Jeanette. I was just going to suggest that if people are interested, probably their first port of call is to ask their oncologist or their, their cancer centre if they're no longer actually seeing the oncologist if there is a survivorship type facility at a place that they can get to. Um, but yeah. unfortunately, there's not many yet of the multidisciplinary clinics in Australia. But there's lots of different models. Um, there's some very good nurse-led clinics for late effects, particularly in haematology patients. So I would get you to suggest you ask your oncologist as first port of call, or go on the internet and do you know just Google. Yeah, and I think that with that question, and I, you know, I think what Sabrina said is you know getting, I guess. A, health professional from somewhere to help you pull all those threads together. Mm. So I hope that answers the question. So then this one, again, is tricky because we looked at there are different types of care plans, um, which is the best one for you. And I think, again, as Jeanette said, talk to your oncologist, I think. And, and what we try and do with these webinars is give you the confidence to go and talk to your oncologist or wherever it is you should be talking to. And you can that say I saw this webinar and these are the questions, the things I want answered. Because mm. if you don't know what to ask, you you know, you're a step behind. I think so. And I would think you agree if, with that? If I had have known about care plans, yes, that would have made it a lot easier. Yeah. Or it would have been the next step. Yeah. yeah. So just one of those pieces in the mosaic. Yes. 
That's right. Yeah. Uh, and it would be nice if, if it is one that's recommended by your oncologist or your survivorship team because they'll be familiar with using it and yeah. reading it and understanding what's in it. Yeah. Um, so that, I think, is a great idea. And if they don't have suggestions, then I guess you can sort of look at the ones that we've suggested as, op as possibilities and bring them to them to see which one would suit them best. Yeah. Okay. So... And then this is an interesting question. I thought about current protocols for newly diagnosed patients um, recommending psychological help and at what point would such an intervention be recommended or provided? So I think this might be a clear <laughs> question. <laughs> The psychological I background. I'm going to be hit with this one. Um, look, I think it's very variable what what psychological help is needed at various stages. So it's a bit of an individual question. Um, I think one of the ways I like to think about the best sort of protocol for psychological help is a bit of a stepped care approach. So um, that everybody has the opportunity for some support, and that might be things like the Cancer Council, um, you know, educational resources around how to look after yourself, how to cope with, you know, concerns about fear of recurrence. So that might be just, you know, looking at booklets and websites and things like that. And if that's not enough or it's not, and it's, you do, your psychological concerns are still overwhelming you and, you know, impeding you, then I would go to more of a sort of face-to-face help. Um, there's sort of an intermediate potentially as a sort of online chat and you know telephone counselling and those sorts of things so you might see that as stage two and if that doesn't help then I think face to face one on one individual support is really the way to go. So I think it's not really about you know at a particular time for a particular disease or for a particular um, in intervention. It's more about the individual and how they're going. And some individuals are fine at the beginning and you know really struggle later on, and other people uh, really struggle at the beginning, but they're not fine later on. So I think it's it's up it's that stepped care thing where you have, all have information um, about where to go and what you know basic coping strategies. If that's not enough, you step it up, and if that's not enough, you step it up again. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the best approach to psychological mm -hmm. help for survivors. So I, and again, I guess it's talking to whoever's treating you yeah. and about your concerns. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you don't, yeah. don't just keep it to yourself and not say anything. No, no. Yeah. So, and, and I think one of the good messages is that these sorts of things are treatable and can, you know, yeah. there are, you know, relatively easy ways to help with some of these things. So it's not that if you're feeling depressed that, you know, there's nothing that can be done about that. It's, you know, there's not that approach at all. I think if you tell someone about it and get the right referral, you know, the vast majority of these concerns can feel lighter once you shared them with someone and got some solutions and strategies. True. And Nell's asked a question there, is the care plan given to the survivor or their GP or both? Good question. I think uh, we do both at Children's Hospital. Um, mm. So I think a copy gets sent we to do the... Too. Yeah, yeah, I think copy is sent to the GP. But a lot of people don't have a GP, a regular GP, so it's, um, or the GPs don't necessarily have access immediately to all of the paperwork. So it's also good to have it on you when you go so that you can pull it out and yeah. not rely on them to find it in your file. And just the online um, mm -hmm. care plans and things that you were talking about and the study, so the age, so they were people that had had a childhood cancer, yeah. but the age group of the people in the study, was that up to, like, what age? I think our oldest childhood cancer survivor was 60-something. Okay. Um, so quite a so, vast variety yeah, of ages. Quite a vast variety, young people. yeah. Um, so, uh, and for them, for the online thing, there are a few issues. So GPs are not super keen on having to remember passwords and logins <laughs> and things Let's like that. Let's do your right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's some benefits there in being able to have it on your mobile um, yeah. or print something out from your mobile and bring it with you on the day um, but so, so that GPs don't have to sit in yeah. there. Anything. The way of the future. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so the last question we have up here, um, so this is, and I think this could have been, and we often have this with haematology patients where they like, and it's this whole term of survivor, like we're bringing up a big issue here probably, like a survivor, are you a survivor even if you're told that you will never be in remission and um, yeah, yeah. I guess that's a subjective, personal, individualised... That's a difficult question. Yeah. In some ways, no one's ever in remission because there's always a chance of something happening again. Mm. Um, but um, 
at the same time, you know, you need to keep moving on with your life. I don't know what Jeanette would say to if someone asked her that. Uh, most oncologists, we don't tend to use the term remission, but I would say you're definitely a survivor whatever the stage of your disease is. Um, so, as I said, we go by the, except for the clinic, we go by the broadest definition from the day you're diagnosed until the day you die, whether or not you've got disease at that time, we would consider that person to be a cancer survivor. Yeah. And the other term a lot of people use is um, living with cancer. Yes. Because that would, yeah. they prefer that than survivor. Yeah. So I don't yeah, know. Some people don't like the term survivor. What are your thoughts, Sabrina? I, are you? I like survivor. You like survivor? <laughs> because yeah. I, I, it's very personal. In a way, I don't feel like I'm living with cancer yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Okay, so that's the question. Um, so we've got some resources here, and as we said, all these slides are sent to you, plus we send you a, a resource sheet, and you can just click on the links of anything that you want to have a look at. Um, so there's a lot of information there, um, and as Claire was saying, there's Peter Mack in Melbourne. There's information online you can get there. Um, there's the Concord Cancer Centre, their, their web page up there, and you can have a look at that. So you can look at, look at all that one later. Um, we'll sort of come to the end of our... Whoops, I'm clicking the wrong thing now. Um, and again, we have our 13, 11, 20 information and support number. So if anyone's got any questions, you can ring up with any question and we try and help you, whether it's you know practical support you want or you want to know about something medical. Um, and we can we just point you in the right direction, basically. Again, they can't really answer medical questions there. Um, and again, Lifeline, if you've got any issues that have come up for you tonight and you really feel like you need to speak to somebody tonight, 13, 11, 14, give them a call. Um, and we have an exit survey, so if you've got a few minutes, we'd love you to participate in the survey. It helps us planning for our future webinars um, and just how the information, how it's helped you tonight and going into the future. So thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. Thank you, Jeanette. At home. You're welcome. And um, I guess we'll send out the recording to you. Um, no more questions come up, I think. So we're a few minutes over time, so we're going to have to say goodbye. So see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Bye.